good to see you here today. Uh, today, we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And so by simply being here, we proclaim to one another that He is alive. Today is the Lord's Day. You know, in the Old Testament, Saturday was the Sabbath. Uh, but in, by the time we get to the New Covenant, after the resurrection of Christ, early Christians started gathering on Sunday because Christ physically rose from the dead on Sunday morning. So we come to proclaim that reality today by gathering. And so if this is your first time visiting with us, you'll notice on your bulletin, on the side here, there's a perforate section. We ask all of our first-time guests just to fill that out, put that in the offering place so that we can have a record of your visit. We hope that you're encouraged here today, that you draw near to the Lord today. Brief announcements before we begin, friends. You notice that we are observing the Lord's Supper, so I want to encourage you to reflect on that reality. And um, if you're... A believer and your repentance, we invite you to participate in the Lord's table with us today. And so let us come with repentant hearts. And by that, I mean we need to think about what these symbols uh, represent, what the bread represents, what the juice represents, and how that proclaims the reality that all of us need the body of Jesus, all of us need the blood of Christ. And we come praising God that He's been provided. You'll notice as well in your bulletin. Uh, that this Saturday, February the 2nd, is the Sleeping Mat Workshop, 9 to 11 a.m. Uh, they meet back here in the old fellowship hall. But uh, Miss Donna Bowman leads that ministry, and they make match for the homeless out of grocery bags. And so if you have any questions about that, you can see Miss Donna right here. They've made 80 so far since I started this ministry. So it's 500 to 700 bags in one of those mats. So you do the math, some of y'all math mathematicians out there. That's a lot, a lot of bags. So... Thank you so much for that ministry, but Miss Donna is always looking for help. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so come help us. Come help us. Um, and you can see the rest of the announcements there in the bulletin. You'll notice our new members, Tim and Julie Cunningham. We're glad to have you all with us. And uh, you see their address there. Uh, also, you see our um, calendar here for February. So pay attention to that. Any other announcements? Anything I might have left out here this morning? All right, well, let's prepare our hearts for worship, and I want to invite you this morning. So it's, it's easy to, uh, kind of on Sunday morning or when you gather for worship, to kind of go through the motions when you're singing, and, and kind of, you've done this a lot. Uh, but I want to invite you this morning, fresh and anew, to think about uh, potential idols in your own life as we approach the Lord in worship, and that you would ask with me that God would tear those from your heart. God would slowly, you know, it's one thing. Whenever you repent and believe, God, God tears the idol of um, trusting in your good works or trusting in someone else to save you. But as you grow in your Christian life, God reveals idols to you that need to be torn from you as He conforms you more to the image of His Son. And so I want to invite you this morning to think about that reality as you approach the Lord in worship. And I, I believe it is the beauty of Christ that, that tears those idols away. Where you see the value of God, you see the value of Christ, you see the value of salvation, what you have in Christ, and it's of infinite worth. And when you start realizing that, reminding yourself of that reality, sin just loses its appeal because it's ugly and detestable. So I want to encourage you this morning to think about that today as we approach the Lord in worship. Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to worship you. It is a great privilege. Uh, you know me, and yet you have loved me. You've given your only son for me, not because of the good that is in me, but because of the good in your son. Your free choice to save me, to resurrect me, Lord. And I thank you so much for that reality. And so I trust in Jesus. I praise you that he has been provided. And so may we get up and sing like the redeemed. Lord, those of us who struggle with sin, may we bring those sins to you and admit that we struggle. May we proclaim the reality to one another that Jesus saves sinners and has saved us. And so may we get up and sing like those whose sins have been crucified in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me. And so you, may you be exalted today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, will you stand? Let's encourage one another in the name of Christ today.
stand up. I need everybody else to everybody else to stand up for me. I need an Adam and an Eve. You're not Adam or an Eve. You can be Adam for me. Come on. <laughs>
study of Big Questions, Bigger God. And today, uh, we'll be in 2 Timothy 3. Look over to 2 Timothy 3. And um, the question is, is, if God is real, why are there so many denominations? So you have folks um, who come against Christianity. This is one of the questions that they ask. And before we begin, I want to give you a brief illustration uh, from the relationship of John Wesley and George Whitfield. Um, George Whitfield and Wesley disagreed on several theological matters, um, but Whitfield was careful not to create problems in public that could be used to hinder the preaching of the gospel. And so when someone asked Whitfield if he thought that he would see John Wesley in heaven, he said, I fear not, for he will be so near the eternal throne, and we at such a distance we shall hardly get sight of him. What's interesting is both of them were of the same denomination in Methodism. And uh, John Wesley was actually a teacher of Whitfield. And the two labored together for revival in the 1700s, but they strongly disagreed with one another concerning uh, predestination. Whitfield was a Calvinist, and um, Wesley was an Arminian. And, um, but they did not let this reality hinder them from seeking to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Uh, they loved one another as brothers in Christ. And it's interesting that John Wesley actually preached towards Whitfield's funeral. This is what Ian Murray says about the two. He says, Doctrinal differences between believers should never lead to personal antagonism. Error must be opposed even when held by fellow members of Christ. But if that opposition cannot coexist with a true love for all saints and a longing for their spiritual prosperity, then it does not glorify God nor promote the edification of the church. And so, if God is real, why are there so many denominations? Well, first off, this question is a logical fallacy. Um, it's the wrong question to ask, but this is the question that is asked. It's like saying, it's like saying, well, a certain leader, and you, you pick the craziest follower of that leader and say, this is what everybody's like. This is what the leader's like. And uh, similar to saying, well, if atheism is true, then why are there so many different forms of atheism? People don't like that, um, but that, they, they never ask that question, but that's the truth. I mean, you, you never know what kind of atheist you're going to get until you talk to them. And there, there's all kinds of different ones. And that's how it is on almost everything. And so the ultimate question to ask, the right question to ask, is who is Jesus Christ? I mean, if you, if you want, want to deny Christianity, you have to deny Jesus. You can't point to the followers. You have to point to the leader. You have to point to the founder. You have to point to Jesus Christ. So who do you say that Jesus is? That's the ultimate question. Not pointing at followers. You've got to point to Jesus. You've got to look at Jesus. 
And so, with that in mind, there are two points I want us to see here today. Now, denominations, the reason why there are so many denominations, first off, is because divine inspiration and divine illumination are different works of the Holy Spirit. All right, now we see these realities in 2 Timothy, okay, 3, 15 through 17. God's Word says, now this is uh, the Apostle Paul writing Timothy. Uh, Paul is nearing death. He's kind of passing the baton to young Timothy. And this is what he tells him about emphasizing the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 15. And now, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, what I want to focus on is that the Word of God is God-breathed. God-breathed, or it's breathed out by God. Now, this is referring to divine inspiration, to where these men throughout the Scriptures, throughout the Bible, whether it's the prophets, apostles, or Christ, you have all of these speaking on behalf of God. And what's going on here is that the Holy Spirit is carrying these men along in such a way that what they wrote was the inherent, infallible Word of God. Now, theologians call it the verbal plenary inspiration of the Scripture, which verbal just means every single word is divinely inspired. Plenary means the whole thing. All right? So there's this, this reality that the Bible is the inherent Word of God. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. That there's an authority that comes from Scripture. The Apostle Peter said it this way in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so what you have in the Bible is men who, with their faculties intact, it's not like the Holy Spirit possessed them. But God had so organized, remember God's sovereign from eternity past, he so organized their circumstances that even though they are using their free will to write, that the Holy Spirit is superintending the process that what they wrote was the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And by the way, this went without question in the church until the so-called enlightenment of the 1600s and 1700s. I mean, everybody, you go back and you read church history, and everybody believed the Bible. I mean, that's not an exaggeration. It's when man thought it started thinking he was so smart that he started doubting it. The scriptures. Because this has been validated not only through history, but it's been validated by miracles. I mean, not to mention that if you deny, if you deny that the scripture writers wrote inerrant truth, you cannot trust that they even got Jesus' words right in the Gospels. Because you have nothing written by the hand of Jesus in the Bible. Not one thing. Instead, in the Gospels, you've got holy men of God who are recording. The words of Christ. And so we, we, we've got to understand what's at stake here. You have this reality of the inspiration. So inspiration means that they could not get the word of God wrong. Right? So this is a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's carrying them along as they write the inerrant and infallible word of God. And so the second thing is divine illumination. Divine illumination. It's different from divine inspiration. And so with this in mind, I want to point out three realities that are necessary for salvation. All right, the, the first one is knowledge. Right? You have to know the gospel. And that, that's why we teach the word here. That's why when you're going on knocking on doors or you're talking to people, you're talking to them, not just saying, hey, what about that Saints football game? Oh, that was awful, wasn't it? You're not just saying that. You're saying you want to tell them about a, a person. You want to tell them about the God-man who came and died for their sins. Right? You want to tell them about Jesus. You want to tell them about the truth. You want to tell them. They've got to have that knowledge. And so that, that's why we're doing catechism here at church. Right? That's the reason why we're taking the children, encouraging parents. Take that ten minutes every week and go over those catechism questions. Because it's getting the knowledge of the Word in your children. Because they've got to have that knowledge. You've got to know the gospel before you can believe. Right? So knowledge is of utmost importance. Utmost importance. Now this is still the Holy Spirit who is working 
But this is a common work of the Holy Spirit. If you can read, you can have the knowledge that's contained in the Bible. You can have the knowledge of it. I mean, even at Vanderbilt University in the Divinity Program, they actually have a Jew who uh, is over the New Testament uh, program, which uh, why you would put someone over the New Testament program who doesn't believe in the New Testament makes no sense to me. But they do. That lady has knowledge. She knows the New Testament. She has the knowledge of it. Um, but there's two other works that are necessary for salvation and understanding the Bible are special works of the Holy Spirit. The second one is agreement. Right? Not only do you have to know the gospel, you have to agree with the gospel. You have to agree you're a sinner. Right? You have to agree that you need Jesus. You have to agree that you need the gospel. And uh, 1 uh, Corinthians 2, 14, the Apostle Paul said, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. It's a result of the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts that we believe. I can remember whenever I first believed. I'd heard the gospel probably a thousand times. I was raised in church from the time I was a little bitty. Every Sunday, going to church, going to church, going to church. But then one Sunday when I was 17, it was like a switch went on. It actually wasn't a Sunday. It was at a youth lock-in. But a switch, it's like all of a sudden, these truths that I had heard and heard and heard and heard, I finally understood grace. And I, I cannot say that it was me. It had to be God. It had to be God opening up my eyes to the beautiful realities that I had kicked to the curb my whole life. And uh, so, so God opened up my eyes to that wonderful Reality, And I now agreed that I was a sinner, that if I was going to be saved, it was only going to be God who could do it through His Son. And I trusted. That's the third one. Trust. So you have knowledge, you have agreement. So some of you, a, that's the danger, friends. You may grow up in church your whole life, and you have knowledge, and you say, you know, I agree that that's true, but do you trust? Do you trust in Jesus alone for your salvation? And trust and repentance are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Because trust means I'm letting go of something I used to trust in over here. I used to trust in my own good works or my own ability. And now I trust in Jesus. So I'm letting go of that and grabbing a hold of Christ. So there's this letting go and grabbing. There's this trust. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of of God. In the famous verse, John 3, 16, and God gave His only begotten Son. Why? So that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish. Have everlasting life. It's so that you, you have to believe. You have to trust in Jesus. And so that's what I want you to see. Understand that divine inspiration means that they're carried along in such a way they cannot get it wrong. But divine illumination means that you have a responsibility. God does open up your eyes and you have this responsibility to believe and it's possible for you to get doctrines wrong. It is possible for you to get doctrines wrong. And that brings me to my second point. I want you to see that denominations mean that the church is believing doctrines rightly and wrongly. 1 Corinthians 1.10, the Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. And so I want to appeal to you, I want to encourage you, if you have a negative view of denominations, right, I, I want to encourage you to, to rethink that some. Because... What are denominations? But Christians gathering around certain truths that are they believe are important. I mean, you want to know why denominations have formed? It's in part because groups of Christians have gotten together and said these doctrines are important and they are worth dividing over. And it's interesting, even those who go and start new <laughs> churches who say, well, we're going to be the church that doesn't heavily emphasize doctrine because doctrine divides. The problem is that that's a doctrinal statement. Saying you don't care about doctrine 
is a doctrinal statement. It's just a new doctrine. You, you may say, I'm against organized religion. The problem is, that is an organized statement. And so I, I want to encourage you, let us, let us think more about this. Um, and I, I think that we can see denominations as positive and as negative. It is not just cut and dry that I'm against all denominationalism. Denominations should not be primarily viewed as separating, but as uniting. But the reason why there are denominations is indeed because of man's error. Divine illumination means that we must submit to the Holy Spirit as we labor. Now the Apostle Paul told young Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth in 2 Timothy 2.15. And so if he had to tell him to rightly divide, what does that mean? It means what? You can wrongly divide the word of truth. And so we have to labor to understand the word of God accurately. We need to be like a, a surgeon, like a scalpel. You know, have a scalpel instead of like a Denver's cutting down trees all the time. Where's Brother Denver at? There he is. You know, like, like not like a logger. But like a surgeon, right? If I go to the hospital, <laughs> I want Denver operating on me. <laughs> I want a surgeon. And that's how we've got to be with the Word of God. We've got to have that scalpel in there, rightly divine, discerning, handle the Word of God accurately. And so I want to leave you with this application. And this comes, this isn't mine, uh, this comes from uh, my president at the seminary I team, Dr. Moore. And I think he ripped it off from somebody in church history. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun, friends. Uh, but it, he calls it theological triage. And what this means is there, there are first order doctrines. Okay? There are doctrines that are important that are worth severing fellowship over. And, and some doctrines would be the, the Trinity. Um, that, God, that God is one who eternally subsists in three distinct persons from eternity past to eternity future. Uh, the full humanity, full deity of Jesus. You know, we need to sever from folks who, who deny those realities. Uh, justification by faith, salvation, not new works, but salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. The authority of Scripture. And so those are first order doctrines where you would need to teach someone, treat someone like a false teacher if they deny those. Um, the second order doctrines are doctrines that we may disagree over, um, but we still need to accept these as brothers and sisters in Christ, but we may need to worship in different denominations. Um, so eventually you're going to have to baptize somebody. How are you going to do that? Are you going to baptize babies? This church doesn't. We believe baptism is after a profession of faith in Christ. We believe baptism is by immersion alone. As a matter of fact, do you realize that Baptists used to get thrown in jail for what we believe about baptism? In this country. Go read church history in this country. Puritans, when they were seeking religious freedom, they were seeking it for themselves at the beginning. Not for Aaron, not for Baptists. They locked them up. We were the red-handed stepchildren. We get get arrested. And uh, I was so thankful for those early Baptists who fought for our ability just to quit getting thrown in jail. You know, they wouldn't even accept marriages by Baptists. In early America, in some of our states, they didn't, we didn't have the proper license to marry people. They wouldn't give it to us, as we believed wrongly, according to them. But I say all that to say, friend, that eventually you've got to baptize somebody. What about church membership? What about church government? You know, so you think of our brothers and sisters in Christ at the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church. Both of those churches baptize babies. Not only that, but they have a top-down government. This church, the government. It's all of you. The membership. Amen. You come together in a business meeting, you vote. You're, you're my boss. Now, not individual members are my boss, but the body gathered is my boss. And not only that, but the body gathered is your boss, too. I mean, that's, that's Baptist polity. It's Baptist church government. You know, so, so those realities are important to where we are distinct denominations. They're important enough for us to come together in different denominations, but... Um, we do gather with the Methodist Church once a year to celebrate our common realities. 
the, the full humanity, full divinity of Christ. I mean, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. These glorious things that we all agree on, and we come together to celebrate. But, but the rest of the year, we are gathering in different denominations because we believe that these truths are more important. Baptism is important. Baptism is important. Right views of the Lord's Supper are important. And so it's important for us to gather and understand that. So they, it means that denominations mean that people are they're believing things rightly and wrongly. And then third order doctrines are things that we shouldn't divide over. Like views on the end of time. Um, worship styles. And the, the list can go on and on of various things that really, yes, we can agree to disagree on and still faithfully worship together. And with that in mind, I want to invite you I'm going to ask our deacons to come forward at this time, and we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper. And I so enjoy, I so enjoy this time, because this is the time where you and I proclaim to one another, where we preach to one another silently as we participate in the Lord's Supper. And I want to invite you, as I mentioned this morning, I want to invite you to use this time to confess your sins to the Lord. Ask that God would reveal idols to you. And that He would tear those from your heart. Because what's amazing, what's amazing about the Lord's Supper is that everybody in here, the holiest person in this room, still needs Jesus. And the most wayward Christian in this room still needs Jesus. And we come together to proclaim that reality to one another. And so, friend, I want to invite you with repentant hearts to enjoy the Lord's table. This should be a sobering time where I'm confronted with my sin, but it should be a joyful time because my King laid down His blood for me, laid down His body for me, and He didn't stay dead He's alive. And He's coming soon to get me and to get you. And I need you to preach that to me by participating today. So with that in mind, I'm going to read in 1 Corinthians 11. Our deacons are going to come and they are going to distribute the bread and then we will pray and observe. And then I will read concerning the cup. And then our deacons will distribute and we will pray and participate. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'm going to invite Brother Mike to come and to distribute the bread.
you so much for the broken body of your son, the body that was given for me. Lord, when I could not keep your law, and you demanded it to be kept because you were holy, and you knew I could not keep it, you sent your son to keep it.
gentleman's wife. That we can have a relationship with you and have forgiveness for our sins. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Scripture says, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Church, I need to hear the gospel every single day. And I need to hear it from you often. So thank you. Friends, with that in mind, let us stand. And we're going to dismiss here in just a moment. I'm going to let Brother Michael make like a few announcements. Uh, Misty asked me to mention before we dismiss, if you've not given us a picture for the church directory, um, please, please do that this week. Right? Try to get the email that. It's our emails in the, uh, in the bulletin. You can shoot her a picture, maybe a family picture, or just use an individual. Just shoot that to her if you want that picture in the bulletin. If you have Facebook or social media and you want her to kind of steal one off of there, just shoot her a text message or an email, let her know it's okay that you want her to do that. Are there any other announcements? Please keep in mind our evening services tonight. Uh, please come and be a part of that. Uh, our director of admissions is with us today. Do you care to dismiss us? Sorry. Hey, Father, who it is to be with these people, we just thank you. That's the gift today.